some of the more common retirement questions that financial planners receive. Well, here to talk with me about this is Dana Anspa from Sensible Money. Dana, welcome. Hi, Bob. Thanks. Great to have you here. Uh, we have been working our way through the 10 most common retirement questions that you receive as a financial planner. We're now on to the last of them. Number 10 goes like this. Uh, what formula or retirement strategy should I use to make sure that I don't run out of money during retirement? I wish there was one formula and we could just Me plug. <laughs> <laughs> it would make it so much easier, wouldn't it? There are multiple formulas out there. One of the most common ones is what's called the 4% rule, where it, you know, you take your portfolio value and it says you can reasonably expect to withdraw 4% a year. So if you had a million dollars, that would be 40,000 and expect it to increase with inflation over time and, and have your funds last for, for a 30 year time frame. Now, the challenge with that is most of us don't spend in a nice, neat fashion. One year we might need 52000 and the next year we might only need 36000 and one year we might buy a car, and the next year we might not, and one year we might need to you know, redo our deck or put a new roof, and the next year we don't. So spending doesn't occur in a, in a nice, neat, linear fashion like that. But there are several other challenges with challenges with that rule. Uh, another is that retirees generally don't need their cash flow to increase at the same pace as inflation. They will need a little bit more each year to cover the, the natural increase in, in prices for food and gas and some of our basics. But in studies of real retirees, their spending tends to slow down in mid-retirement. And so on an inflation-adjusted basis, they're actually not spending more and more and more each and, and every year. And so the 4% rule doesn't take that into account either. There's Another strategy, the required minimum distribution strategy. Now, required minimum distributions currently don't kick in until we turn 72, and that is a formula that takes your year-end balance and a divisor based on your age, which says that every year you're older, you withdraw a larger portion of your remaining balance. Now, that actually does make sense to me. And as people get older, they can withdraw a much larger portion of their remaining balance because they have less time over which that withdrawal is going to be sustainable. So one way that a retiree could apply something similar is to say, well, if I'm retiring early in my 50s, uh, I probably need to take out less from my portfolio on average than if I were going to work until 70, I could probably withdraw a much larger percentage of my remaining portfolio balance. Now. As you know, I'm a fan of customized planning. I think rather than following any of these rules of, of thumb, you should chart it all out and determine exactly what you'll need to withdraw each year and look at it on a, a holistic basis, something we call a, a fundedness plan. And I think that's going to give you a much better picture of what types of, of withdrawals are sustainable. So there are a couple other um... Uh, types of uh, withdrawal strategies, dynamic versus static, uh, uh, capital preservation rules. Any thoughts about some other of these other strategies? Yeah, I forgot about dynamic, which is one of my favorite things, actually. So a more dynamic strategy says that in years where the market would go up, for example, or you have more money at the end of the year than you had the year before, you would give yourself a raise and you would take out a little bit more than you did the year before. We call these inflation raises that we offer to clients. On a year where your portfolio value went down and down by a pretty large number compared to where it was the year before, this is something that a fellow financial planner, Jonathan Guyton, developed. I first heard him talk about it in 2006, I believe it was, and it was called the capital preservation rule. And I can't remember if it was if your portfolio was down 10% or 20% from the year before, but there was a certain trigger where if it had gone down enough, you would initiate a reduction in your withdrawal. And so that would be an example of a dynamic strategy that you were following where you were adjusting your withdrawals. 
I feel like the what we call the fundedness ratio accounts for that, where we are projecting withdrawals out over a retiree's lifetime and calculating a ratio that says, okay, if you come to me and say, can I take out an extra 12000 this year or an extra 50000 depending on what's going on, I want to take my family to Alaska, or I need this new car, or we want to do this remodel on the house, if we plug that number in and over your lifetime it still meets a certain ratio, then we say, yes, you know, that's sustainable. Now, oftentimes those one-time they're not really one-time expenses, but those periodic expenses that come up are sustainable versus if someone wanted to take an extra 50000 out each and every year, we might say, no way. You know, your plan would fall apart. That wouldn't work. So those are all examples of dynamic strategies of having a way to plug in when you need some extra and also having a preservation rule that says if my portfolio gets to a minimum point, I know I will have to consider a reduction in my withdrawal. So a question I know I get often, probably you two as well, is uh, if someone's using the RMD method and they happen to be overfunded, oftentimes people say, well, I, I don't need my RMD. I'm required to take it, but I don't need it. Uh, what should I do with it? Do you, you have any thoughts about that? Yeah, we have many clients in that situation, and there's a few things. Some of them will gift a portion of it to charity. So if you use what's called a qualified charitable distribution, you can gift right from your IRA, and it will reduce that portion of the distribution. It will reduce your adjusted gross income by that portion of the distribution. So there's a, a tax advantage to doing it that way. Other people will simply transfer the the investments. So let's say they had to withdraw twenty thousand dollars this year, and we would calculate the number of shares of you know let's say it's an S and P five hundred fund, and transfer that amount of shares out of their IRA and into a non retirement account, a trust or a joint account or an individual account. And so the funds stay invested, but they have come out of the IRA wrapper. They get a ten ninety nine that reports that amount for taxes, but the funds stay invested. So those are two strategies that people use when, when they don't need their RMDs. Right. And when you're thinking about these strategies, do you, do you also think about um, preserving the, um, the, the um, longevity of the portfolio, right? A lot of times folks that worry about running out of money, um, how do you sort of deal with that? Yeah, of course you worry about running out of money. Our full-time job is worrying about you running out of money. <laughs> That's what we do for our clients. And we approach it in a very engineer-like way with a series of stress tests that we run every single year because we need to make sure you will not run out of money. Now, we are pretty lucky in that in many times our job becomes telling people that they can actually do some of the extras. But in terms of a, you know, a formula to use, you really have to have a way of projecting your account balance over your lifetime, taking the withdrawals that you plan to take, using a realistic assumed rate of return, and seeing if the money will last. Now, as I said, I've been lucky in that many of the people we work with are able to do some extras and take out more than they thought. But of course, I've worked with a few people who um, were in what I call the danger zone, where I truly thought they were at risk of running out of money. And in that case, we went through their budget with them and found ways to reduce expenses. Uh, in one case, I had this couple, and even into her 80s, she loved to decorate. She needed the new curtains and the new pillows and the new latest fabrics and colors and styles every year. And so we agreed that she could keep her decorating budget up until her portfolio hit a certain minimum point. And in her case, that point was about half a million. And if her portfolio at the end of any year ever dipped below half a million, then we would need to restrict that decorating budget. So that was another way of you know, approaching this to allow someone to do th those things they really enjoy, but making sure we were holding enough back that she was never truly at risk of running out of money. So here we've covered the 10 most common questions that you get. Um, any way to put a bow on this, a, a wrapper around all the questions that we've addressed in our series here? I wish there was a way to put a wrapper on it. Retirement is complex. 
it's one of the things I routinely hear are people who have done their own planning and investments. And when it comes to that point in time where they truly need to live off their acorns, it does get more complex. There's a lot of moving parts. And so for all you listeners out here, you know, my hat's off to you for watching all of our videos and learning as much as you can. Thank you.